In today's video, we're going to talk all about overall length, how it affects velocity, and as usual, show some hard data on how this works in real life. First, overall length, or cartridge overall length, is the total length of a loaded round. So, it's the dimension of the case head all the way to the tip of the projectile. If you're familiar with load data, this is the dimension that is usually specified in all the manuals. And I know some people feel that that's the only length that they should load to. If you're loading a single caliber for more than one firearm, and ultimate accuracy isn't something you're concerned with, this should be a safe number, and if that's a number you'd like to use, that's fine. Unfortunately, some guys think that this number that's in the manuals is written in stone, and they can't deviate from it regardless of the application. This is one of the reasons that guys like me will tell you, you need to read your loading manuals, and it never hurts to read more than one. You will find frequently that they have language, like in the Horny Manual, that we're going to reference in this case. Looking at the Horny Manual, 10th edition, page 76, they actually discuss a couple comments about seating depth. First, a projectile may not appear accurate simply because it is not seated to a suitable depth for a particular firearm. Second, in general, less distance to the bore, the greater the accuracy, meaning the closer the projectile is to the lands, the smaller the groups you might achieve. Third, a reloader has entire control over this up to the limitation of the action, magazine, or the barrel itself. Through experimentation with seating depths, you can find the best one for your application. So you don't need to take it from me or this reloading manual specifically, as this is not restricted to Hornady either. On page 148 of the Burger Manual, there are several pages dedicated to it, and even on page 100, they have a testing procedure you may want to think about using for a guideline. So why do I bring this up? I frequently have people ask me why I don't talk about these case gauges, and if you're a fan, I'm not telling you not to use them. But this tool doesn't tell you what you're measuring, and it certainly isn't going to find the optimal case dimensions or optimal cartridge overall length for your application. If you'd like to know if a size case or a loaded round is going to fit in your chamber, they will work. However, in my opinion, it's just not the optimal tool for this application. Hopefully now you can agree with me that altering cartridge overall length from the book value is not the craziest idea. And this is probably the best tool in our toolbox as reloaders that we have to be able to shrink the groups for any given projectile. This is one of the reasons I'm just not a fan of these case gauges. Just because it fits in here doesn't mean it's going to be optimal for your firearm or that you're going to be able to repeat whatever performance you got by loading around to fit in this case gauge. So what do we use then? There are various tools that can be used. Hornady makes overall length and headspace gauges that can be used with a standard set of calipers to give us comparative measurements that when we find a load we want to duplicate, we have the measurements to be able to do that. There are similar tools from other manufacturers, such as this Short Action Custom Set, that can also perform a similar function, but when you're choosing tools, it's really a combination of what you want to measure and what your budget is going to allow. If you're familiar with this tool, you will see that instead of measuring overall length, this is actually using the ogive of the projectile as a reference, and this is typically much more repeatable than using overall length itself. Projectile tips tend to vary from one to the next, and ogive should be more consistent and give us a more reliable and meaningful measurement to take. So when we talk about the data we're going over today, we're going to be discussing this in CBTO, or cartridge based to ogive, instead of cartridge overall length. In some of these cases, I may give you both measurements, just so you can see how one relates to the other, but for recording your own data, I would encourage you as a minimum to record your CBTO measurements. So for certain now we know what cartridge overall length is, why it's important, now we need to know how do we implement it. Now there are numerous ways to do this, but the process we've been testing out here lately on the channel is the one put forth by Eric Cortina, and we've had some reasonable success with it so far. But to summarize the steps really quickly, the first thing we're going to be doing is finding jam, or the starting cartridge overall length of which we begin to test. I have an entire video on this if you'd like to see it, but essentially we need to find the shortest cartridge overall length to start with, and we'll be shrinking the cartridge overall length from that value. The second thing we need to do is find powder charge by testing powder and primer at the same time if possible. We've already done it with our combination we've gone over today, and we'll summarize that data here in a second. The third step is performing the cartridge overall length test, where you're starting at that jam minus 20 point and shrinking your cartridge overall length while looking at group size. The velocity data we're going to be talking about today is coming from running that test on this combination. Make sure you stick around for it. I think it's pretty interesting. Once that part of the test is performed, we can go back and adjust our powder charge slightly up and down to make sure we're still in that optimal node for our combination. Like I mentioned, today's data is coming from that step three. We're using the 143 grain ELDX. We've already found our jam measurement point 
And yes, the first samples from today will be slightly set into the lands. Today's test will cover a total variation of almost 60 thousandths, and at least 40 thousandths of that will not be contacting the lands, so we'll be able to see the velocity change as we decrease cartridge overall length. The last video on this combination was where we tested a powder with Reloader 16. We started with the Fed 205M as well as the CCI 41. With that data, we developed the graphs we'll show on your screen now, and our widest plateau was with the Fed 205M, and the center of that was somewhere around 42.6 grains. So that is a charge weight of which we're going to test. Before we started doing today's test, we tested five rounds. The average velocity of those was 2888, with a standard deviation of 7.4 and extreme spread of 19. Those seem to be reasonable values and a pretty reasonable standard deviation. So now that we have these values, we're going to see how, what happens and how they change as we shorten the cartridge overall length. One of the questions that I've had multiple times when we've done examples of this testing is what's going to really happen with our statistics as we change the cartridge overall length, as I think some people are afraid that modifying that cartridge overall length is going to ruin our statistics. This is a little bit of the chicken and the egg argument of reloading. Which one do you complete first? The cartridge overall length or the charge weight? I personally don't care how you do it, and after you see today's data, maybe you won't be quite as concerned, but who knows? It's just another good data point. So for our load test today, we're using the Hornady 143 grain ELDX, part number 2635. We're using Lapo with three times fired brass. It's been annealed, full length size, the shoulder pushed back two thousandths, and our neck tension is being set with a .242 mandrel. Our primer for today is the Fed 205 Match AR, and the charge weight we're using for all of our rounds is 42.6 grains of Reloader 16. So this velocity data is coming from running the cartridge over length portion of this test. There are three rounds at each cartridge over length, and we're going to see how the velocity changes with each one. Our primary test is going to be using the cartridge-based O-Jive measurement of 2.240 inches, moving in 3,000 steps. We're testing all the way down to a cartridge-based O-Jive measurement of 2.183 inches, and we're going to be looking at velocity and extreme spread along the way. But first, let's talk about our velocity. We ran our initial test to get our velocity curve. We found that 2882 feet per second was a velocity that we expected. Remembering again though, when we tested our five shot group, the 2888 was what we achieved. Still pretty close. Starting at 2.24 inches, which is a cartridge overall length of 2.890 inches, we started off at 2897 feet per second. We can see as we adjust this in 3000 increments, our velocity went up slightly, and then back down to 2893. But we can see as we decrease the cartridge over our length, our velocity also decreased slightly with it. Like I mentioned, our cartridge over length from the beginning of the test to the end of the test only varies about 60 thousandths, actually around 57. But let's make this graph a little bit more meaningful by putting on the extreme spread data. Starting off that 2.24 CBTO, again, 2.89 inches cartridge overall length. For three shot groups, our extreme spreads stayed somewhat reasonable. I will put for a point of reference, if you didn't notice before, the touch point of this projectile lands was right around a CBTO of 2.227 inches. So we can see as we back away, the velocity starts to drop. Again, remembering there's three velocity measurements at every single one of these points. None of the extreme spreads are getting too crazy. Even if you measure all 12 of the last rounds, varying that cartridge overall length, almost 10 thousandths, we still had an extreme spread within 17 feet per second. The average velocity of our last four groups was 2865, 2866, 2871, and again 2866. I think I mentioned in one of my previous videos that this was a combination that I took into the woods this year to go hunting, but I loaded it even shorter to what I, because I wanted to work with one of my five round magazines. So I list all the way down to a cartridge overall length of 2.820 inches, which isn't represented on this chart, but would have been a CBTO of 2.170 inches. So I tested a seven round string of this before I went into the woods with it. My average velocity was 2868 feet per second, standard deviation of five feet per second, extreme spread of 14. My opinion, not too shabby, and this is what I did take into the woods. I had some left over, and so before we started today's test, I wanted to test my leftover ammunition. So again, at that same cartridge over length, 2.820 inches, CBTO 2.17. The on the day of test, we had an average velocity of 2866 feet per second with a standard deviation of 4.5 and an extreme spread of just under 12. It's slightly different than the first data, but shot on a different day, different conditions, and essentially the same average velocity. So it appears even when we push that projectile further into the case, that whatever pressure increase we're getting in the cartridge with that, we're also increasing the amount of gas that's sneaking around the projectile before the projectile enters the rifling. So at this charge weight, varying the cartridge over our length, we seem to have a very consistent load and have no problems keeping our extreme spreads below 20 
which is generally my goal. If you're like me, most of the data you've seen that will show you that pressure actually increases as cartridge overall length decreases. And while that may be the case, it doesn't appear to show that way in real life, at least as far as velocity measurements that we took today. Now, if you'd like to see a quick example, we'll run these numbers in quick load, and we can see at our longest overall length of basically 2.890 inches, the max pressure for quick load was 61,361 psi. As we decrease that cartridge overall length to 2.833, the estimated pressure for quick load rises over Sammy's max and it's estimated at 63,520 psi. Looking at the cases real quickly, there's no real difference in the cases as far as pressure signs that I can tell, but as usual, I will leave that judgment up to you. Looking at today's data, doing the incremental load development test, developing that charge weight, even though we varied the cartridge overall length, I still think it showed that we could vary that cartridge overall length without affecting the general performance of the load. Looking at the performance of today's rounds, I think we did lose a little bit of velocity as we altered that cartridge overall length, but the overall performance of the combustion didn't seem to change. So if you're concerned about which one to do first, cartridge overall length or combustion, there doesn't seem to be a negative to the combustion, at least that I can tell so far. But if you'd like to see more examples where we use this incremental load development method to attain low standard deviation loads, check this video out here and I'll show three other cases in there where I think this was useful. If you'd like to learn more about this load development process overall and all the steps, make sure you check out this playlist here. Like, subscribe, and all that fun YouTube stuff. I hope to see you come back next week. And until then, stay safe and small groups.